Now, you are on the air now. Good evening. I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order on at seven o'clock on December the 21st, 2020. And I certainly want to welcome everyone here tonight, my colleagues, members of the staff, others who are attending the meeting and anyone who's listening to it at home. We're so glad to have you with us. Before we have the moment of silent meditation tonight, uh, I wanted to just share a little something. Um, W.H. Auden, the great English poet, uh, wrote a poem called September 1st, 1939. It was written just a few weeks into World War II after Germany had invaded Poland. And it was a very dark time. And uh, it made me think, not that this time is as bad as World War II, I don't want to get that mixed up, but it has been a difficult time this year with the COVID virus and so many things that have come from that. So I thought I would read this little, little passage at the end of Auden's poem before a moment of silence. Defenseless under the night, our world in stupor lies, yet... Dotted everywhere, ironic points of light flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I, composed like them of eros and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. So let's all show our affirming flame tonight and in the months to come, and we'll all get through this together. So will you now please join me in a moment of silence? Thank you. All right. Council Member Reese, will you please lead us in the pledge? Hello, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, colleagues, staff, and Durham residents watching at home. I will now say the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, council member. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Stuhl. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Council member Caballero. Here. Council member Freelon. Here. Council member Freeman. Present. Council member Middleton. Here. Council Member Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And now I'll ask, are there any announcements by members of the council? <clears throat> council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've got a number of announcements before I go. Um, I studied that Auden poem in college um, and it honestly didn't make much of an impression on me then. But on the Saturday morning after the September 11 attacks um, in 2001, uh, NPR's Steve Inskeep read a portion of that poem aloud on um, Morning Edition on Saturday, and uh, it's remained as part of my memory of that time in our communal lives ever since. Uh, and so I got a little bit emotional when you read that portion of it, um, because it's very, very meaningful to me personally. So thank you for doing that. Uh, First of all, I wanted to say that the good news is uh, there are vaccines and they have arrived in Durham. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, the Durham Health Department received its first shipment of the Moderna vaccine earlier today. Uh, it is being prioritized um, for inoculation for Durham residents as part of the plan developed by our public health experts, both here in Durham and statewide. 
look forward to seeing more folks uh, getting the vaccine in the weeks and months ahead. Um, as you know, Mr. Mayor, it's really, really important uh, that the vaccine be prioritized first uh, to our frontline uh, workers who are in contact with members of the general public. Um, that is both public employees and private employees. Um, the elderly folks with, um, uh, with uh, health conditions uh, that qualify them and also for our more vulnerable populations. Um, and so I just wanna encourage everyone uh, to know that the broad uh, swath of American leaders that you've seen being vaccinated over the last several days uh, should be a signal to everyone uh, that the, these vaccines are safe and effective. Um, and I certainly intend to be vaccinated when it's my turn in line. Um, but I did wanna make sure uh, that folks know that uh, I will not certainly one would not be jumping the line in front of folks who need it far more than I do. Um, as this uh, pandemic has shown, uh, I think a lot of folks uh, in our situation can uh, can uh, deal uh, with the kind of the isolation that we need to do uh, because we can do our jobs remotely. A lot of folks can't, and so those folks should be ahead of us in line. Uh, so I'll be um, I, I have absolutely no concerns about taking the vaccine. But I'll do it when I'm when I'm satisfied that enough other folks have gotten it that our community is a safer place. Uh, second announcement I wanted to make is that um, additional help is on the way from the federal government. Very soon, uh, we hope that the that the federal Congress uh, will pass a new COVID relief bill uh, into law uh, that will provide much needed relief for families across North Carolina and especially right here in Durham. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of parts to the bill, including transit funding for our Grove Durham Transit System uh, here in Durham, um, additional uh, federal funds for individuals and families, although it is a very, very tiny amount of money, unfortunately, um, and support for uh, rental assistance, support for additional small business support, uh, and support for our live uh, stage venues and independent theaters. Uh, part of the Save Our Stages bill got folded into this COVID relief package. And so I know that our staff is busy coming through the almost 6,000 page bill that's making its way through both houses right now and on its way to the president's desk for signature. And I know that we'll have more news about that in the, day, in the days and weeks ahead, but just wanted to put that on folks' radar as something that um, is at least a start in helping uh, recover uh, from what is still a devastating pandemic. The third announcement I wanted to make, Mr. Mayor, is that I'm sorry. And um, I want to apologize and talk about how I intend to uh, do better uh, as this pandemic continues to unfold, despite the existence of vaccines. It's going to be a while before everyone is inoculated against this deadly virus. And so we're going to be living in this kind of world uh, for a while now, uh, for a while going forward, even though folks have been starting to get vaccinated. I'm sorry because I don't believe that I did enough uh, so far during the course of this pandemic uh, to support the really awful condition that renters and our small local businesses have found themselves in over the last eight or nine months. Uh, I don't think it's, it was a failure on my part of effort. It was more a failure of imagination. Uh, like many of my colleagues on the council, I suspect um, I spent countless hours uh, wading through our city ordinances uh, looking for additional levers to support our renters and small businesses. I looked at what almost every other city of our size and larger was doing in the United States to find out, are there other good ideas that we're not implementing? Um, and I think we can be proud of much of the work that we have done as a council. Uh, in partnership with the county, we put millions of dollars into loans and grants to small businesses here in Durham. We put millions of additional dollars into rental assistance for low-income renters to keep them in their homes during this pandemic. Um, and of course, the work of the, of the round tables here in Durham has, has really put our arms around our business community and resulted in lots of things that we are trying to do to support our businesses. But I didn't think of everything. Uh, and um, I will pledge uh, going forward that I've, I've gotten a, a number of good ideas or interesting ideas uh, from folks on social media about other things we could try. I will be surfacing those with staff in the days ahead. Um, but I wanted to make one other pledge uh, to folks who may be listening. If you are a renter in Durham and you believe your landlord isn't working with you as well as they might, 
to help keep you in your home despite the fact that you've lost your job or are otherwise suffering during COVID-19. Or if you're a small local business and your commercial landlord is similarly not working with you the way that you think that they ought to, I hope you will email me at charlie.reese at dermancy.gov and I will prostrate myself before your landlord to try to beg them for help, for mercy. The problem is this, our closures in Durham and around the state and around the country have fallen much more heavily on the end of the economic ladder, the bottom of the economic ladder being individual workers, individual residents, and, and our small local businesses who are bearing the brunt of the pain of this pandemic, both economic and otherwise. Folks further up the economic chain, the capitalist system, uh, landlords, banks, uh, mortgage holders, those kinds of larger uh, financial entities aren't experiencing the same kind of pain because local governments like ours can't waive rent. We can't, we can't forbid the collection of rent for uh, residential or commercial purposes. So we are forced uh, to doing lots of other things uh, like the small business grants and loans, like rental assistance, uh, direct assistance to uh, low income families. I don't know what else to do, but uh, there are some ideas that folks have come up with and I'm gonna be running by staff. And in the meantime, I will call your landlord and beg them to have mercy on you. Uh, all you gotta do is email me and I will do that. Um, if I, I don't know if that'll be effective or not, uh, but it's worth a try. Um, so uh, I am sorry. Uh, again, I think it was a failure of imagination on my part and not effort, and I will do uh, better uh, over the next little while. And finally, Mr. Mayor, my last announcement is that um, earlier today, uh, Governor Roy Cooper of North Carolina signed an executive order allowing to go uh, mixed drinks across the state of North Carolina, effective about two hours and 11 minutes ago. As you may know, my father used to own a bar. I grew up in a bar. Uh, and so that, that industry is very important to me. Um, and the way that that industry has suffered not only the, the folks who own these businesses, but the folks who work in them has been really heartbreaking to me over the last uh, seven or eight months. And so I just wanted to encourage everyone, if you are so inclined uh, to take advantage of this new thing that the governor has allowed us to do better late than never, I guess. Um, I think some establishments are still working out how to make that happen, but, um, but we're gonna uh, figure it out uh, together. And um, I think it'll be uh, just one more thing that businesses can do to try to stay afloat until we develop more immunity throughout the system through vaccination. So encourage folks to do that. So far, I know of two businesses in Durham that are doing that, uh, Luna, Rotisserie Downtown, and Kingfisher. Uh, so, but there'll be lots more in the days ahead that'll be announcing that. So those are my four announcements. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Council Member. Other colleagues, any other announcements tonight? Councilmember Caballero. Thank you and good evening. Um, I wanna just thank my colleague for being extremely thorough and that means that my comments can be more brief. Um, I want to do a, another call out for folks to stay home uh, through the holidays. Uh, I was asked to go uh, with a Centro Hispano on Friday and do a community plug in Spanish asking the Latino community, which right now uh, we like to party at this time of year. Uh, La Noche Buena, the 24th, you often stay up till midnight. You hang out with as many friends and family as, as possible. But th this year is different and my it's really a plea. I know that folks are saying you can gather inside, you know, the state order is up to 10 folks inside. And I would say that that's really honestly not safe. We need folks to stay home the next two to three weeks in Durham and North Carolina are gonna be so crucially important. We will not be visiting my dad, even though we did go see him over Thanksgiving. We isolated for seven days, got tested beforehand. It's not enough. You really, exposure right now is, when it's in community the way it is right now, it is really, really hard to mitigate spread. And so I'm begging Durham to stay home for Christmas stay home for New Year's so that you can celebrate with your family next year. It's not worth bringing it home to your family. It's not worth the older folks in your family getting sick. It's not worth folks who are immune compromised. There will be other holidays. There will be other New Year's. So 
a mi comunidad, por favor, que se dejen en casa. No, está, no estamos seguros, no estamos al otro lado de esta pandemia. Mi consejo es que se queden en casa y celebran en casa solos. Pueden hacer llamadas por WhatsApp, por Zoom, pueden ver su familia de esa manera. I think about when we first came to the States, you know, my mom used to tape record messages. It was so expensive to do international calls that she couldn't afford to call home. So it wasn't even about getting to be with your family. She couldn't even afford the phone call to call on Christmas day, to call for birthdays. So we would tape record ourselves and send our news that way. And she would mail those tapes to family back in Chile. And that's how we communicated for many, many years. And I think about how blessed we are right now that we have WhatsApp, that we have FaceTime, that we have Zoom, and we can connect with folks in ways that previous generations really just couldn't do. So again, my plea is to stay home, stay safe. Please follow the orders issued by our governor. It's so, so important. Thank you. Thank you very much, council member. Any further announcements tonight? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening to you and good evening colleagues and good evening to all who are watching. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for lifting up that wonderful verse uh, at the beginning uh, of the meeting. I think it's highly appropriate and, and a beautiful uh, capturing of the sentiment. I think that um, we all struggle and grope to find words for, but I thank God for poets. Uh, Mr. Mayor, firstly tonight, I want to uh, just celebrate uh, the incredible Old North State and the type of people that we have here. Uh, last week, President-elect uh, uh, Joseph Biden named uh, a North Carolina son, Michael Regan, uh, to head the uh, EPA, the EPA uh, Administrator Designate. I, uh, there's a bunch of us who are particularly proud of Michael. He is a graduate of North Carolina a and State University. Uh, so shout out to HBCUs and shout out uh, to the Aggies. We certainly uh, send our prayers and congratulations to him uh, and his family. Uh, we're all extremely proud and we are hopeful and, and trusting that it will be a smooth and quick uh, confirmation process uh, through the Senate uh, for Director Regan. Uh, we're also hearing a number of other names being floated around the state for other uh, positions uh, in the cabinet. So we are certainly um, proud uh, of that. So we send our congratulations uh, out to Mike to, uh, this night and to his family. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I do also uh, want to uh, again extend uh, the warmest holiday wishes to, to all uh, Durham residents for our Jewish brothers and sisters that's finishing up Hanukkah and our Christian brothers and sisters that will be celebrating Christmas and, and Advent and Kwanzaa and winter solstice. Uh, what I love about Durham is that it is a rich tapestry, a very varied mosaic. Uh, we have people in Durham that range from that uh, cover all faith traditions to no particular a faith tradition to traditional African belief systems to, to know a belief system, but we are all one family. Uh, one thing that, that rests with me tonight uh, is that uh, uh, one universal, universal principle shared by just about all of the great faith traditions uh, in the world is the utter resistance to succumb to darkness and to hopelessness, um, which is why light is so important during this time of year. So many traditions um, focus on lights uh, a pushing back against the darkness, a pushing back against hopelessness on this evening. Um, but we know that there are a lot of people in our city on tonight that are dealing uh, with darkness and, and struggling uh, with depression. And, and Councillor Reese eloquently spoke to economic challenges that many of our people are facing. And uh, the gunfire continues uh, in our city as well. And I want to send out um, condolences to the most recent uh, victims of gunfire in our city. Uh, which is, hasn't abated as we hoped it would uh, with the weather. Uh, but I think there is light. Uh, and, and I believe as we go into 2021, I'm, I'm uh, excited. Um, I'm, I'm emboldened, I'm strengthened uh, by the things that are before us as a council, as a government uh, to do um, that would start to constitute a, a, a substantial um, and an actual response uh, pieces of a puzzle being put together to respond to gun violence in our city. I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to the violence interruption being brought back before us with actual numbers in January as our uh, staff 
um, said it would. Uh, I'm looking forward to the, the initiatives we're looking at to address root causes coming back before us. I'm saying these things tonight because I want folk um, during the season to recognize, to realize that there is light and that we are pushing back against darkness. We are pushing back against hopelessness and we are not succumbing to it. Uh, and that this government is committed uh, to doing concrete, substantive things uh, to push back uh, against the darkness. Um, so with that said, um, thank you again uh, for the poem, uh, Mr. Mayor. I want to fully associate myself with everything Council Caballero uh, said as well with response with respect to this uh, ongoing pandemic. Um, I share uh, Council Reese's excitement um, about the vaccines coming. Um, I, I will say that 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 uh, to those of us who have been hurt before in some, a number of ways, and uh, given the, uh, America's uh, the United States of America's uh, medical history, particularly with people people of color, um, black people uh, in this country, um, that I hope that we will um, find the courage and strength to navigate uh, these waters. I actually have uh, been approached about possibly um, because of that history, uh, getting the vaccine. Um, not to jump in front of anybody in line, but some of us are afraid to get in line. Uh, and if that can help uh, inspire and encourage some folk to get in line to begin with, uh, that that might be uh, something helpful, uh, useful. So so I just want to say to folk, um, as Council Caballero said it far ele more eloquently than I did, continue to, to do the things that will keep us safe. Uh, but on this night, just know that uh, the light is shining and darkness will never overcome it. And hopelessness is, is not part of our culture and our values here in Durham. Uh, may God bless all of you uh, during this holiday season. May God bless and protect our city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Council Member. Any further announcements? Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I appreciate my colleagues taking the moment to share all those insights and I also appreciate them making my comments a little bit, a little more brief. Um, just noting uh, just one addition really is to just acknowledge that testing is important and acknowledging also that you may think it's a cold, you may think it's just, um, you know, your normal, just not feeling well. It's important to make sure that you continue to be tested as well. And so just noting that Derm has uh, made available uh, a variety of testing sites at like, I think at Holton and JJ Henderson and up throughout Central Hispano. There, there are resources available. I just wanna make sure folks are aware that testing locations um, are available throughout the city. Uh, and then just uh, one additional point, I, I just been and reflecting on some of the comments made. Uh, it's important to also note that we have not had a bailout for our homeowners. And so just noting that foreclosure is around the corner with all the rents that are not being paid. And it's gonna be important to actually dial up our, our resource, resource levels and support that needs to be in place to make sure that people can, can stay in their homes. Uh, it's, it's important to not miss that aspect of it. And uh, just wanted to note also, um, I, I wanna make sure that I put a fine point on the way we, we look at lightness, light and darkness, and just acknowledge that sometimes in that darkness, it's an opportunity to, to see what you cannot see in the light and to reflect. I don't want us to just focus on the dynamic of just light and dark um, as they've always been held juxtaposed to each other. I think that in, in this darkness, in this year of 2020, our sight has been clearer than it could have ever been um, acknowledging how much harm has been caused by violence, whether it's gun violence or, you know, government sanctioned violence. There's a lot that we can see in this dark moment. And uh, I'm mindful of how much we take into 2021 and the work that we have ahead. And I am grateful to have the opportunity to serve and be on the council with with my fellow count colleagues who are very visionary about these things. So I, I just wanted to note that. And then I also wanted to make sure I thank, I think um, one missing thanks was to all our frontline workers themselves, especially in the healthcare. I'm, I'm mindful of a few folks that I know who've had to get COVID tested and are waiting to hear back on whether they have it based on the line of duty that they're in. And um, also aware of 
few losses that folks have experienced uh, locally and just acknowledging that this, this COVID is still continuing to take lives and it's, it's, it's a lot to carry. So I just want folks to make sure that they're taking care of themselves and tending to their, to their emotional, uh, physical, and emotion, uh, I mean, physical, emotional, and, and, and uh, et cetera, needs that, um, that will keep you healthy and safe. Uh, other than that, I thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's all. Thank you very much, Council Member. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you everyone for, for your comments and just wanna wish a happy holidays to everyone in the community. Um, this is a tech question. I've just been uh, notified by some folks who are trying to watch the stream that there's a problem with the sound um, on all of our streaming platforms and wanted to um, ask our tech folks to take a look at that. And I'm wondering if we should take a break until we can get that fixed. Um, because right now no one can hear us at all on any of the streaming platforms. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, ask um, our tech folks. Um, Vivian, can you hear? Can you hear me? I'm now seeing in the chat that a couple of people are writing to us that they can hear. I can hear over Zoom. We can hear on two different computers. We can hear. Over so. Zoom is is fine. It's just the um, the stream. No one who hasn't been invited to participate in the Zoom is is here on the Zoom. They're all trying to watch on YouTube or on the city website. And I see. Those are all not working. Okay. All right. Um, let me ask, is there anyone here from our tech world, Vivian or others who can comment on what you think the um, we need to do about that and should we hold off a little bit uh, and take a little break until we can get that going? I don't see Viv on the line. Mr. Mayor, I just uh, pulled up uh, YouTube on my uh, iPad and it's like a it's like the people talking are too far away from the microphone and there's a lot of audio static in between um, so mm -hmm. you can kind of hear what people are saying but it's hard going yeah well let me let's just uh, let me ask again um, I'm sure uh, Ms. Page is probably checking manager Page is probably checking this out uh, and We'll just wait a moment um, to hear from our administration on anything that they want to tell us about this little technical glitch here. Mr. Mayor, um, members of the council, we are uh, troubleshooting right now. Uh, that matter. We'll be back with you shortly. All right. Thank you very much. We'll just wait a little bit until um, we can get that cleared up. Meanwhile, should I tell you the story of when I actually um, saw W.H. Auden in person? Yes, please. Let's hear it. Um, you all aren't old enough, but I am. I love saying that. Um, Auden came to Chapel Hill when I was an undergraduate. I really wanted to see him and I went over to the auditorium there, which some of you Tar Heels will know that I can't remember the name of, it's old, it's near the old well. Um, and I wasn't able to get in because it was packed. But I saw a friend who I grew up with in Lynchburg who told me to come to the back of the building. He let me crawl into the men's room window. I did so. I then came out onto the stage. Apparently, I didn't know that's where you came out of. Auden was coming in on one side of the stage while I was coming in on the other. 
Um, I did uh, quickly leave the stage and sit in the aisle. But um, anyway, that's my WH Auden in-person experience. That's a really great story. Trespass. It's, it's, I love it's it. entertain, it's entertainment. Uh, it's entertainment while we're waiting for the check to get passed. <laughs> Yeah, I accidentally discovered um, Auden. It was one of the one of the greatest library moments of my life. I was in high school working in a library and was just kind of browsing through the poetry section, starting with the A's. And I randomly picked up a book and opened it and found all this amazing anti-war um, poetry at a time when there was um, there were a lot of like we had just uh, bombed Iraq and just a lot of anti-war movement energy happening in the in the U.S. and I remember just being so excited to find that book of poems and reading everything I could find that he that he wrote. I think it was serendip a little bit a little bit of serendipity in my my young life. That's awesome. Um. The clerk has said that DTN is working on audio for the social media platforms. Oh, I said she mean I mean she means they're working on it. I see. Not that it works, but that they they're working on it. Okay, great. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, well, I suggest everyone order out one of those cocktails while we're waiting. Well, sadly, they haven't worked out the, the delivery aspect yet. Uh, apparently, um, smarter people than I am have reviewed the executive order. And you can get a delivered cocktail, one cocktail per person, um, and both people have to be there when the delivery person hands them off. So you can't just sit at home and say, I have 10 people in my apartment, I need 10 old fashions right now, please. That doesn't work. Now, in order to do that, the drivers are gonna have to some training to figure out, you know, probably check IDs and whatnot. Um, and the drivers have to be over 21 or 21 or older. And I suspect they haven't figured out like to, how to deploy that training yet. So it might be a little while before we get the delivery part working. Um, but hopefully some of our establishments can get some curbside options available because uh, that would be ideal. Right, this just happened today, right? And we should be good to go. The governor signed it this afternoon. It went into effect. All right, we're good to go. Thank you. Yep. 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 All right, thanks. Yep. Colleagues, I think while we're uh, waiting for this, I, I see no harm in going ahead with the priority items. I think well, that's next on our agenda, so I think we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, and first, I'll call on our city manager. Madam Manager, any priority items tonight? Good, good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the uh, City Council. We do have several priority items uh, for your consideration this evening. Uh, agenda item number five, Department of Water Management, Miss Lake Facility Expansion Design Services, Stantec Architecture Incorporated, Amendment Number Five. There's additional information that has been provided, and it is in Attachment Number Four. Uh, agenda Item Number Six: The Williams Water Treatment Plant Paving Construction Award to S. A. Hauling and Utilities Limited Liability Company, doing business as creative concrete construction. There's additional information that has been provided 
uh, and it is in attachment number seven. Agenda item number 19, consolidated annexation, Carrington Woods two, motion number three and attachment 20 were updated. Attachment 18 was also updated. Agenda item number 20, consolidated annexation 924 Old Oxford Road. Agen attachment number 14 was added and attachments number 11 and 13 were updated. Agenda item number 21, consolidated annexation 551 Olive, Olive Branch Road, motion number four and attachment 18 were both updated and attachment number 16 was updated. And finally, agenda item number 22, consolidated annexation for 115 Angier Avenue, attachment number nine was added and attachment number one was updated. Thank you very much, Madam Manager. Madam Attorney, are there any priority items tonight? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, and members of City Council. It's good to see you all. The City Attorney's Office does not have any priority items this evening. Thank you, Madam Attorney. Thank you. Madam Clark, any priority items tonight? Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Madam Mayor Pro Tem and Council members. The City Clerk's Office has no priority items. And I did want to let you know that the social media stream is up. Great. Up and Thank you, Madam Clerk. That's the news we were hoping for. Okay. All right, great. Um, colleagues, uh, we're now going to move into the consent agenda. The consent agenda is consists of items previously worked on by the council and can be approved by a single vote of the council. Items can be pulled from the consent agenda by members of the public or members of the council, and if pulled, will be heard at the end of the meeting. Uh, I'll now read the consent agenda. Item one, Raleigh-Durham Airport Authority Mayor's nominee for reappointment. I'm gonna pull that item from consent. Item two, safety and wellness task force appointments. Item three, discussion of the Workers' Bill of Rights as written by the Durham Workers' Rights Commission. Item four, interlocal agreement with Go Triangle to reimburse the City of Durham for technical services related to commuter rail. Item five, Department of Water Management, Miss Lake Facility Expansion Design Services, Stantec Architecture Incorporated, Amendment Number Five. Item six, Williams Water Treatment Plant Paving Construction Awarded to SA Hauling Utilities Limited Liability Company, doing business as Creative Concrete Construction. Item seven, Water Plant Residuals, <coughs> excuse me, and Wastewater Plant Biosolid Services Contract with Sinagro Central LLC. Item eight, Contract for Insurance Broker Services. Item nine, cooperative group purchase contract, five automated refuse collection vehicles. Item 10, cooperative group purchase contract, police patrol vehicles. Item 11, contract with CLEGS, termite and pest control LLC for pest control services. Item 12, contract with Godwin Elevator Company, Inc. for elevator maintenance and repair services. Item 13, city of Durham employment and training 2018 to 20, grant project ordinance, superseding project grant ordinance 15613. Item 14, 2020 Blue Benevolence Grant Project Ordinance. Item 15, the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Justice Programs, Bureau of Justice Assistance 2020 National Sexual Assault Kid Initiative SAKI Program Grant Project Ordinance. Item 16, expansion of fiber optic network agreement with Duke University to construct the Durham Housing Authority Campus Network. Uh, those are the items in the consent agenda, and I'll ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item one. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Council Member Freeman, seconded by Council Member Caballero. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Call the called roll. Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. I vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Well, now we move to our general business agenda of public hearings. And the first item is a consolidated annexation for Carrington Woods Two. Hey, good evening, Mayor Shul, Madam Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, Honorable Council Members. 
Alexander Cahill here with the planning department. I'm happy to be here with you tonight. I do want to state for the record that all planning department hearing items tonight have been advertised and noticed in accordance with state and local law, and that affidavits of all these notices are on file in the planning department. For Carrington Woods too, we've received a request for a utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, future land use map amendment and zoning map change um, from Glenwood Homes LLC for an area of 8.56 acres made up of 20 single family detached residential units. This is around 833 Clayton Road. Uh, the annexation petition is for a contiguous expansion of the corporate city limits. Glenwood Homes is proposing to change the zoning designation from residential suburban 20 to residential suburban 10. The development plan associated with this request proposes a maximum of 20 single family detached residential units, which is an increase of eight units compared to the existing zoning. The area is currently designated low density residential on the future land use map. If approved, this annexation petition and associated applications would become effective on December 31st, 2020. The applicant has proffered for construction of an offsite sidewalk prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy within the existing right of way on Clayton Road and along the west side of the existing sidewalk south of Meadowcrest Drive to Glen Rose Drive. Uh, the maximum number of housing units was revised from 23 to 20 in tax commitment number two on the development plan. The landscape buffer was revised from 10 feet in some places to 25 feet in tax commitment number three on the development plan. These proffers have been reviewed by the transportation and planning departments and found to be legal and enforceable. City and county operational departments such as solid waste, fire and EMS have reviewed this request and have not identified any significant negative service delivery at cost or impacts to the city. Um, public works and water management departments also have performed the utility impact analysis for the ex utility extension agreement and have determined that existing city of Durham water and sanitary sewer remains do have capacity to serve this project. So staff is recommending three motions for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second is to adopt a consistency statement. And the third is for zoning ordinance. Uh, thank you very much, staff and the applicant are available here tonight for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Cahill. Mr. Cahill, did I miss it or did you also already uh, indicate in your comments that uh, these have been appropriately advertised? Yes, uh, I opened up with that. Thank you for double Thank checking. you very much. You have heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open and I'm going to first ask if, ask if there are any questions for staff by members of the council. All right, seeing none, um, there are two people that are signed up to speak on this item. Uh, one of them is Penny Sicadio, and the other is Garrick Sevilla. Um, let me ask, uh, are those uh, two people here with us? Madam Clerk, do you happen to know Penny Sicadio? Uh, I'm yes. sorry if I've got that name right, and Garrick Sevilla. Yes, Mr. Mayor, both are in attendance. All right, great. Uh, is there anyone else, let me ask now, that would, uh, that would like to be heard on this item? If you were here tonight uh, to be heard on this item, uh, and I'm not aware of that or did not call your name, if you could please put that information in the chat or raise your virtual hand uh, so that the clerk can identify you. I don't see any other hands up, uh, but if there are any, um, please let us know. I see that both, uh, now I, I believe now I see Ms. Sacablo, perhaps the correct, Sacablo is perhaps the correct pronunciation. Um, I see that the two speakers are both proponents. So I'm going to call on Ms. Sacablo first, and um, you have three minutes, and then uh, we'll follow that with. Uh, Garrick Sevilla. Uh, Ms. Sicadlo, welcome. Uh, yes, thank you. My name is Penny Sicadlo. I'm the principal engineer of Penny Engineering Design uh, at 9220 Fairbanks Drive in Raleigh, North Carolina. This project has been before you uh, once before, and we heard concerns that we needed to attach a development plan to it. We have attached a development plan, and as you heard, 
it uh, has been modified from our review from the planning commission and with our discussion with the neighbors. We tried desperately to meet all the criteria of safety and traffic and uh, privacy that we could uh, with the neighbors' concerns and with the, with the comments we heard from the planning commission. I think that um, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that this particular client has agreed to make a connection of the sidewalk to the existing Southern High School. I think that was a, a concern of the neighbors and, and I'm very proud to find a way to make that happen for the neighborhood and uh, willingness of this development uh, to perform that task. Um, we have reduced the number of lots to 20 lots and we have uh, offered a, a rather substantial 25 foot landscape buffer uh, on, on the entire perimeter of this project. Um, in an attempt to offer some privacy to the existing development. Um, I think this will be uh, a very good, consistent development with the existing neighborhood. Um, the lots are of the same zoning, of the same size, and I think it would um, be a very good addition to uh, Durham's landscape. Thank you very much, Ms. Codlow. Mr. Cardo, I'm going to ask you this question, uh, not for you to answer right now, but uh, before we leave tonight. Um, the, what is the approximate length of the off-site sidewalk that's being proffered? And what would you say the approximate cost to construct that would be? So I'll just leave that question with you uh, and I'll go on to Mr. Garrett Sevilla. Uh, that's fine. I'll, I'll do a measurement and get you an answer. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor. Um, members of the city council. I'm Garrick Sevilla. I'm the attorney for Glenwood Homes. Uh, some of what I'm gonna say is gonna re uh, retread some of what uh, Ms. Sicadlo had said. Uh, this is Carrington Woods 2. There was a Carrington Woods 1, which was the first iteration of these consolidated petitions. Uh, the city council denied uh, Carrington Woods 1 about two years ago now uh, in December of, of 2018. Unlike the uh, present uh, consolidated petitions, that was a straight zoning change from our RS-20 to RS-10. And at the time, the uh, council had expressed uh, a desire for Glenwood to further engage uh, and conduct outreach with the neighboring residents. Uh, we heard that, we went back to the drawing board and instead of a straight rezoning, we decided to submit a development plan that would support uh, the specific residential subdivision we uh, envisioned building. And uh, we committed to act with just complete transparency with the neighboring residents. And so within days of submitting uh, the first draft of development plan, we convened uh, an in-person meeting at the nearby Durham Public Library uh, in September, 2019. So this was pre-COVID. Uh, and, um, and we also shared a sketch of the subdivision um, plan that uh, we expect to uh, to submit if annexation and rezoning are approved. Uh, we provided hard copies of these documents with all of our mailed notices, and we also provide electronic copies uh, to any of the residents that gave us their email address. Um, and like Penny said, the, the main concerns really centered on traffic through the existing neighborhoods. Uh, we, we, are, we are interconnecting uh, through existing neighborhoods, so there will be some uptick in traffic. Uh, the, the residents also expressed concerns around privacy and then also the safety of pedestrians along Clayton Road, particularly the students of Southern High School who walk along uh, Clayton Road and through the wooded areas. And one of our, our main goals throughout this process was really to, to win the support of the residents, to earn their support. And we had uh, multiple Zoom meetings and follow up to the uh, initial meeting at the public right. library. And as a result of this back and forth, we made the, the changes to the initial development plan that, that Penny outlined. Uh, you know, the reduction in dwellings from 23 to 20 is significant and will mitigate, uh, you know, some of the traffic through the existing neighborhoods. And then also the 25 foot project boundary uh, will provide uh, a privacy. Um, one of the concerns we heard throughout was, you know, the safety of, of pedestrians on Clayton Road. And there was a lot of frustration that the um, residents expressed with what they see as neglect uh, of, of that of that road of improvements on that road, and again for the you know the the high school students um, you know, who walk to that school, 
uh, even though this project of ours is, is just 20 homes, uh, you know, we wanted to, to step up and be part of the solution to the extent we were able. And we wanted to, you know, set an example for other developers who wish to, to build in this area. So uh, we added the sidewalk text commitment as, uh, as Mr. Cadlow discussed. You know, we hoped all of these, um, you know, these changes to the plan would, would win the support of residents before the, the planning commission uh, in September. Um, unfortunately, we didn't, but we were very encouraged to receive the almost unanimous uh, recommendation endorsement of the Planning Commission. There was just one vote against. And so tonight, we're similarly hopeful that the, the council will recognize our efforts to address the uh, residents' concerns and, and vote to approve the consolidated petition. Uh, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sevilla. I see that there's another uh, person that would like to speak on this item. Uh, and that is Quincy Radcliffe. Uh, is Quincy Radcliffe available to be heard? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, and welcome, and you have three minutes. Okay. Um, I do, uh, good evening, everyone. But I do I agree with everything Attorney Sevilla has stated, They ha and Miss Penny. They have met with us on previous occasion occasions and tried to accommodate our requests. Um, our concerns are the safety of this area and they have tried to hear us and they have tried to assist us. And yes, our problem is still safety with the, pedest the amount of pedestrians that use public transportation. Um, the neighbors who walk and exercise, we do not have sidewalks. Clayton Road is unsafe. It's only a two lane road. You, whenever you're walking on the street, you have to get onto the grass and or whenever cars are approaching. And not just that, but Twin Lakes, when they build those 20 homes, their Woodland now is, Woodland Park Road is now going to serve, not just Twin Lakes, Carrington Woods, but it's also going to serve another new subdivision that's being built at the end. Um, and there is nothing being done to address our safety issues. So yes, we are concerned with the um, amount of safety, amount of safety that's not being addressed somewhat by them, but nothing by the city. Um, we're concerned with the noise level, the loss of a wildlife, the ability to exercise safely. We don't have that. So I do like the plan. I can speak specifically for me. I do like the plan that they just presented with the 20 homes and adding the 25 feet buffers. Yes, that is a better plan than what they previously pre presented. So, but those are my concerns at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Radcliffe. You're welcome. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? If you're here and you would like to be heard on this item, please uh, put your name in the chat or raise your virtual hand. Let me just check and make sure that we don't have anyone else who would like to be heard. All right. All right, colleagues, uh, you have heard the speakers tonight um, and uh, we'll begin now with any questions or comments you may have. But first I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. Cadlo uh, if she could uh, answer the question that I asked previously. Yes, I did look it up. It is uh, about 450 feet of sidewalk and uh, building it along an existing right of way would cost in the neighborhood of $18,000. Thank you very much. All right, colleagues, any questions or comments at this point uh, for the uh, applicant or for staff? All right, uh, Council Member Freeman. Thank you, and just in light of the comments that were made, I just wanna make sure that the staff does address um, how safety is being addressed in that area in regards to pedestrians specifically. Mr. Cahill, can you address that please? Uh, yeah, I can, that's a great question and I can address it to the best of my ability. Um, in terms of safety, um, it, you know, the, the sidewalk that's being proffered is in addition um, along Clayton Road. Um, it, as a, portrayed on the development plan, 
Um, it's one, one way to address safety. Um, in terms of the rest of the development plan, you know, there aren't commitments that address, you know, crime prevention through environmental design or anything at this level. Um, however, when you get to the site plan level and level of specificity there, there are other ways to address safety concerns. In terms of an overarching approach from, uh, you, know, you know, planning's perspective, um, this is just one project in the area um, and we can't require them to do, do a lot of the things within the UDA ordinance. Um, so the applicant is proffering the sidewalk um, at their own behest, and at their own financial burden. Um, unfortunately, that's the best answer I can give at this point. Thank you, Mr. Cahill. Yes, thank you, Mr. Cahill. Uh, it might be helpful to hear from Mr. Judge specifically on projects that be occurring in this area. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, so there is a uh, funded uh, bike walk plan from the 2017 bike walk uh, implementation for a small segment of sidewalk on Clayton and Freeman Road from Chandler Road to uh, Obsidian uh, Way. It's on along one side of Clayton, one side of Freeman, and then a crossing. Uh, it was primarily intended to, to help get folks from the existing neighborhood a little bit south of this development along uh, Woodland Park Drive and Chandler Road. Uh, access to to Southern High School. So that project is in right away acquisition now. Um, so in um, finishing up, hopefully we'll go to construction sometime in 2021. Uh, beyond that, I mean, yeah, we've heard from yeah, Ms. Ratcliffe and a number of the other neighbors out here. We do know there's there's a large need for a large number of sidewalks in, in this general vicinity, whether that's Clayton, Chandler, Cheek Road, Ross Road, Junction Road. Um, there's a long list of large number of needs that we're trying to work through on. Thank you, Mr. Judge. Thank you, Mr. Judge, and thank you, Council Member. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to make a general comment um, that projects like these, which are, you know, very low density, small single family developments, um, are, are pretty easy. Uh, and, and when developers spend time talking to community members, they often end up being even less dense than they were before. And I think this is an example where the developer removed several um, units at the behest of the community. And while I think it is really important to, you know, to, to work with community members and to be in communication with them, I also just wanted to just, just wanted to recognize that when that the way in which that is happening now is in many cases leading to us getting less housing um, when the community broadly needs more housing and and more dense housing and when developers come with proposals for um, these kinds of single family developments there's typically very little opposition um, in contrast to the townhome developments that we've been seeing lately which are more dense though perhaps not as dense as um, would be more dense would of course be more sustainable, but they are denser than what we're getting now and are often much more difficult for, for developers to push through and get a lot more community opposition. And I don't know how to solve this problem. I just wanted to highlight it as a tension that I continue to see in our development cases that the, that the broader needs of our community in terms of more dense, more affordable housing um, are not being served by by the process that we are, by the process that we're using now, and that often the the things that we're asking developers to do actually create even more problems for that for that broad goal. And it's not unique to Durham. I think you know it's it's common across the country that any more density gets opposition from neighbors who live in um, in less dense housing. But you know, contrasting this to the townhome development that we had um, at our last meeting with dozens of people speaking in opposition. Um, I just worry that we are, I just worry that we're not gonna be, we're not getting what we need um, with our current with our current process. Uh, that being said, I'm gonna vote for this item, thanks. Thank you, council member. Colleagues, I think if, if unless you have some particular need to, uh, 
before we continue with our comments, unless there's anyone uh, from the council who objects, I'm gonna go ahead and close this hearing. Is there anyone who has a problem with that at this point? And then we'll have our comments. All right, I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed. The matter's before Mr. the Bain, council. I saw my hand, I know it's in there. Oh, okay, apologies. Just a quick question for staff sure. mm -hmm. in, in light of um, Mayor Pro Tem's comment. And, and I'm not sure if, if Sarah is, is prepared, but just noting that, is there a plan in place for moving forward with some small area planning so that these communities, especially in the areas where we're annexing and bringing online additional housing with a two lane road, is there any planning in place or, or is there a plan in place to move forward with some small area planning? Good evening, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Members. Sarah Young with the Planning Department. Um, Council Member Freeman, that is a good question. Um, I will tell you that as part of the comprehensive plan effort, we are looking um, at a variety of different areas that are um, experiencing either development pressures that have particular development challenges. Um, to call it all small area planning in kind of the traditional sense, um, it'll be a bit different from that. Um, but we do plan to try and address these issues um, through the development of the comp plan. So um, I know that's a, a, not an immediate answer, um, but the comp plan is a thoughtful process that will take a little bit of time still um, in order to hopefully get us on the other side um, with better policies and plans in place to effectuate the changes that we need um, to be able to have development that actually works in our community. And just for verification, is that still like at least two to three years away? And so we need something in the interim to, to kind of help counterbalance exactly what Mayor Pro Tem was saying. So I would say that it's probably at least two years away. Um, I will say that we have limited staff resources and every time we try and do a Band-Aid fix, it will only delay further the overall comp plan that's already going to uh, somewhat be the case with the Searles project. So just in full transparency. Um, but I think that one of the things that um, is very possible is that as we develop policies in the comp plan, our plan as staff is to go ahead and implement those in the ordinance so that we're not waiting two years before we start making a bunch of changes um, that actually start hitting the ground with live projects you will start to see um, as we develop policy accompanying UDO changes um, following very closely on the heels of those. So as opposed to past plans where we wait and we draft the whole thing and then at the end we get it adopted, we're essentially gonna be adopting it in little chunks as it's being developed to try to get at this very issue. Thank you, that's all. I appreciate you sharing that. I think it's insightful for the public to hear. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Young. Thank you, council member. I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed. The matter is now before the council and we'll be interested in your comments. Council member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanna thank staff for their work on this project. I wanna thank the, the resident who came to speak about it. And also wanna thank the applicant uh, two years ago, almost to the day, two years and three days ago, uh, this council met um, and uh, voted against the annexation portion of this project by a vote of four to three. I was one of the folks who voted against it. Um, the reason I voted against it at the time was that the developer had a lot of good ideas about how to moderate some of the traffic related concerns and pedestrian safety related concerns uh, that the folks who live are in, in and around this area had about the project, but was the developer was not um, willing to proffer a development plan that would allow them to commit to those things. So in the absence of that, it did not make sense to me uh, to move forward with an annexation. Um, and uh, three of my colleagues agreed. Uh, today, uh, two years and three days later, um, they've come to us with the development plan that uh, commits them to doing all the things they said they were gonna do, do two years ago. Uh, with that in hand and uh, acknowledging uh, that the neighbors still had com have concerns about this project, the Planning Commission voted overwhelmingly to recommend it to us for our approval. Uh, the project is a essentially a notch that appears carved out of the city jurisdiction uh, that this annexation would bring into the city. Um, and the, the
the density that is proposed here, 20 homes on this relatively small piece of property, um, it would be comparable to the neighborhoods that surround it. Um, and so on those bases and given the uh, sidewalk improvement and some of the other things, uh, it's my intention to support the annexation uh, when it comes for a vote uh, and the rezone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councilman Reese. I uh, appreciate you bringing back to like the, the, <laughs> the case and how it all shaped out. I, I think it's important to note that the comments that Quincy Ratcliffe identified haven't changed much of what's happening on Clayton Road and many of the neighborhoods um, that are experiencing this development pressure are gonna consistently keep coming forward with the issues around traffic, pedestrian safety and the other. And I think it's important to note that our staff is now prepared to address it in a better way and, and acknowledging the chunking of policy changes and, and noting that the, the comprehensive plan is not coming in another couple of years or coming to completion within another couple of years, it makes a huge difference. And the work that we're trying to do, and I know that the joint city county planning staff or planning um, is moving forward with some of that small area planning conversation. And I'm excited about what's ahead. Also just to, just to put a kind of pinpoint on the race equity issues that, that align in this conversation are huge. And if we miss the opportunity to also include kind of an equity statement on how we move forward with these types of development, acknowledging the history of how uh, developments have happened across the country with um, a lot of the, the, the harm caused to people of color, we'll miss um, not actually stating why we've had uh, some of the angst or some of the what we've seen in the community uh, or the response in the community, like in the ones that are experiencing this development pressure. I won't call it gentrification because it's different, but this, this is going forward, this and this being the types of cases like this are going to continue to come forward. And we have to be very proactive of, of acknowledging that there has to be specific attention paid to communities um, that have experienced this development pressure without having planning in place or the resources in place to do the things that need to be done, like adding sidewalks. So in, in a case like this, where we're annexing um, the county into the city, acknowledging the, the costs that's gonna be incurred, and then also on the other side of it, the, the equity issues that might come about in a, in a specific community. There's a lot of details that are, that are going to have to be checks and balances and I'm hopeful that our council will be mindful of that as we move forward because it's not the same in every case. And so in different neighborhoods where the push was for it to remain rural, um, I think we've, we, just have a, we just have a lot more to pay attention to and to be mindful of at, in each of these cases because they are not simple. They're very complex and the layers that are in them include race equity. They include transportation shortfalls and, and funding. Um, they include the, the, I mean, the environmental injustice or the environmental hazards that have been in place for um, areas that have flooded. They include a variety of areas that, that we have yet to really nail down how we're going to address it. And so I just want to, to note that I will be in support of the case this evening, but it is in, um, in light of our developer actually being mindful of how we need to move forward in this. So thank you. Thank you, council member. Any further comments? I'll just comment real briefly that um, the, the, the commitment of a, of a lengthy segment of off-site sidewalk um, is extraordinary, especially for a 20 home development. Um, and I want to appreciate that. And I also want to remember that because the number of times that I've heard developers come in here and say they can't commit to an off-site sidewalk, uh, we now know that you can commit to an off-site sidewalk. Um, it does raise the price of housing. I think we have to acknowledge that. It's an $18,000 expense. It's going to cost almost $1,000 per unit to do this. 
So we, we don't want people doing it all the time, but there are times when we really wanted it. And I just uh, want to say that I appreciate it. In this case, I think it's absolutely right uh, because it does answer, I think, the most significant uh, pedestrian concern that's raised, not just by this, by this uh, development, but by the fact that the existing developments are going to be served by this, the development that Ms. Radcliffe lives in, for example. And finally, this, uh, and I think Councilmember Reese mentioned this, it, when you see this, this is an area, a wooded area that is surrounded by housing. Um, this not only is going to be developed, but should be developed for this purpose. So I'm definitely supportive and appreciate the, the, the uh, comments by my colleagues. All right, um, Councilmember Freelock. Yeah, I'll be super brief. I just wanted to say to my colleagues that I, I appreciate the backstory because when I'm reading, you know, the Planning Commission comments, <laughs> you know, Charlie always mentioned how detailed Miller is, and he talked about this coming up in 2018, and I was curious about the backstory, and I don't always have the opportunity to call you and be like, hey, what happened in 2018? Um, so it's been really helpful for me to hear uh, you know, some of the critiques from Mayor Pro Tem, some of the context from you, Mayor Shul, about the sidewalks. It's, as a new council member, I'm, I'm just really appreciating the dialogue. You too, uh, colleague Freeman. So just wanted to say that. Thank you, council member. I, I think that there's such a big learning curve on these development things when you first get on the council. And uh, I certainly experienced the exact same thing. Not only the, the 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 ordinances and the technical aspects, but the back the history of these cases, and I agree with you very much. So I'm glad we're proving ourselves useful. All right, uh, colleagues, uh, we will need three motions on this. The first would be the motion to adopt an ordinance annexing Carrington Wood Two into the City of Durham, effective December 30th, 2020, then entering into the Utility Extension Agreement. So moved. Second. Seconded. Moved by count by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, seconded by Council Member Reese. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. I vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it and the motion passes unanimously. We'll next move to motion two to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Second. second. Moved by Council Member Freelon, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Thank you, Council Member Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. And now we'll move to the third motion to adopt an ordinance to amend the United the Unified Development Ordinance. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilmember Freeland, seconded by Councilmember Reese. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. I vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it and the motion passes unanimously. I want to thank Ms. Radcliffe for being here and for her comments. I want to thank uh, the applicant and I want to thank our staff. All right, we'll now move to item 20, Consolidated Annexation 924 Old Oxford Road. And first we'll uh, hear our report from staff. Welcome again, Mr. Cahill. Good evening, thank you for having me, Mayor Shul, Madam Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, honorable council members. Uh, look forward to spending the night with you tonight. Uh, we did receive a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation and initial zoning map change for 924 Old Oxford Road, case BDG 20-0006. This is for one parcel of land totaling about 3.4 acres located at and around 924 Old Oxford Road. This is from individual landowners Celeste Ritchie and Jason Errol. 
um, and they are looking for a contiguous expansion of the existing corporate city limits with this annexation petition. The site is presently zoned residential suburban 20. And if this annexation is approved, staff recommends an exact translation of this zoning designation, which means that it would remain residential suburban 20, but in the city limits. If this was approved tonight, it would become effective on December 31st, 2020. The site is presently undeveloped and heavily wooded, and the owners do intend to construct just one single family residence for their own personal residence on the vacant parcel after the site is annexed. City and county departments have reviewed this request and have not identified any significant negative service delivery costs or impacts. Additionally, Public Works and Water Management have performed the utility impact analysis and determined that the existing City of Durham water and sanitary sewer mains do have capacity to serve this project. Budget and Management Services completed a fiscal impact analysis and determined that this proposed annexation will become revenue positive at build out. Additional information related to this can be found in the staff report. So staff is recommending that the city council approve this utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation and consistency statement for the proposed zoning map change. Staff recommends this approval based on several key findings, which include the contiguous nature of this annexation, the minimal impacts to existing city services, and the revenue positive result found in the fiscal impact analysis. Uh, there are three motions that are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement with Celeste Ritchie and Jason Errol. The second is to adopt a consistency statement. And the third is for the zoning ordinance itself. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, staff and applicants are also available for any questions this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Cahill. Colleagues, you have heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open, and uh, I'm going to ask if there are any questions by members of the council for staff. But before I do so, I just I do have one question, Mr. Cahill. Um, I am I was unable to understand from the annexation uh, map where this parcel. touches the city limits. Yes, I can pull that up for you right now. There we go. Are you able to see that, Mayor Schull? Yes. Okay. So the parcel in question is the hashed, yeah. hashed area? And the contiguous, the city limits are the dashed line here. Okay, great. I, I see. I've missed that map somehow. Thank you. Okay, so the we have a very funky parcel here. Um, it, it includes not just the, the kind of triangular shape, but it also includes the road going out to Old Axford Highway, correct? Correct. Mr. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Um, are we okay with that? Uh, I can defer to Bill Judge on that. I'm, I'm really not talking about the transportation issue. I'm talking about this kind of, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have any objections that I can think of, but I wondered, is there anything problematic about annexing this parcel and then having you know, with this one, you know, very thin line that will be, I'm not sure exactly, a driveway or, yeah. So Ms. Young is coming, coming, uh, coming to help. Ms. Young. Uh, good evening. So, yeah, this is a, what we would call a flag lot type situation in essence. Um, and we, um, it's not uncommon to have these pop up. Um, one of the reasons that in an annexation, we ask all of our partner departments to identify um, any potential issues of situations like this where there may be an issue um, concern, for instance, about um, confusion along the roadway if there's an emergency call, you know, 911. But um, there have been no identified issues with this. Um, and because flag lot situations are fairly common, um, I, I don't particularly um, see a concern with this situation. Thank you very much, Ms. Young. Mm -hmm. That was what I wanted to know. 
All right, uh, Council Member Middleton had a question and then I see Council Member Freeman or a comment. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, for recognizing me. It, I don't really have a question. I, I do uh, want to make a uh, disclosure before we engage uh, in the uh, public hearing. While there's nothing statutorily that constitutes a conflict of interest for me uh, in this hearing, I, I do want to disclose that uh, the not-for-profit that I serve as chief executive officer of owns a significant piece of land uh, actually, it's almost neighbors at the corner of Old Oxford and Thompson. Um, so I did want to disclose that again. There's nothing statutorily that constitutes a conflict, but I, I did want to, uh, just for full transparency, uh, disclose that while not me personally, the organization that I lead does have is a vested stakeholder uh, in this area, and I think that should be known uh, before we engage in the public hearing. So just wanted to share that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member, for for that disclosure. And I just want to check in with the City Attorney as I'm. Sure, uh, Madam Attorney, uh, uh, just to uh, make sure, uh, Councilmember Middleton is not, there's no personal uh, benefit to him in any way accruing in this regard. He is still obligated to vote on this issue. Is that correct? That's my, that's, yes, my interpretation of the statute. All right, great. Thanks. Just wanted to make sure we all were on the same page. Thank you. And thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just following up on your line of question, noting that this is a that single um, road into that flag lot, I just wanted to just get verification that the I guess, I'm assuming that the property owner is pro, is paying for the paving that would occur for this location, so that that lot or that length of street would be paved by the property owner. So I will, Sarah Young again, I'll let Mr. Cahill correct me um, if I have misunderstood, but because this is a flag lot, it's not a street, um, it would be a private driveway. And so yes, it would be the property owner's responsibility to pave their driveway um, however they saw fit in accordance with the ordinance requirements. Is that correct, Mr. Cahill? A good that is correct, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, before we hear from the people who signed up to speak, are there any more questions for staff? All right, then. Uh, we've got two people who've signed up to speak. Councilmember Freeman, do you have another question? Yeah, just a follow up. The so the essentially that streetway would not have like any type of uh, fire hydrants or like no road and gutter. Like I'm trying to get some clarity on, on this, dif like this difference? That's a great question, Councilwoman Freeman. Um, so I think what we're thinking, if we wanna think about it is Old Oxford Road is a road that services the site. Um, and then if the applicant chooses to pave a driveway up to Old Oxford Road, you know, that's that's private property, but maybe that's the, the distinction. Um, as of right now, that's not a road, that, that, that would just be a private drive. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Cahill. I, I, I essentially was just trying to figure out if they could pave all the way through, like if they could have a street actually, or the connected driveway to both roads. Thank you, council member. All right, any other questions for staff before we hear the speakers on this item? All righty, if not, then we'll hear uh, from the, we have two people sign up to speak on this item, Celeste Ritchie and Jason Errol, uh, who are the applicants. Uh, and we'll first begin with Ms. Ritchie. Is Ms. Ritchie available to be heard? Hi, good evening. Yeah, this is Celeste. Hi, how are you? Uh, welcome, and you have three minutes. Thanks so much. Hi, folks. Um, I'm one of the property owners with my partner, Jason Errol, and just wanted to share a little bit about ourselves and the project. Um, so we both love Durham. I moved to Durham in 2004, and it, it definitely feels like home. I DC stole me for a little bit, but I'm back now. Um, probably a lot of you also know we've been volunteering in our neighborhood with the Bragtown Community Association, um, actually learning a lot about development over the past couple of years um, and just working with the community to address the needs and um, different challenges around development. So I guess just sharing that, you know, as we've deepened our connection with the community over the past couple of years, we're just excited to continue those relationships um, and that organizing and just take responsibility to be good neighbors and good community members. 
Um, for the house itself, we plan to age in place. So we're thinking of this as our forever home. Um, we wanna make sure it's ADA compliant. So we have, um, you know, it's one level, there's a front ramp entrance. Um, we're still designing it, but you know, we wanna make sure it's framed so that we can add grab bars and things like that as time goes on. We're trying to make it as energy efficient as possible um, and also remo removing as few trees as possible. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to share. I don't know if it's okay, but Jason can just speak from my computer as well, if that's all right. That's fine, Ms. Ritchie, thank you. We're glad to have you. Mr. Errol, also welcome, and you also have three minutes. Thank you, Mayor Shul. Um, uh, again, like Celeste said, Durham is home for me. I moved here in 93, and uh, apart from, you know, DC stealing us away for a little while, even when we were there, we always knew we were coming back to home to Durham and that we were gonna hopefully uh, live out the rest of our lives here. Uh, we feel really invested in, in Durham and in this community. Um, we're hoping to build one house and um you know we do have some dreams for the the other land that we own right near there we would really love to build some affordable housing we've been working and talking with a lot of affordable housing developers and folks with expertise in that area um and um so we're hoping that we can uh you know really live our values and instead of being like nimby we're like yes our backyard build affordable housing but um but yeah, this is all just so, the annexation is really just so that we can connect the city water and sewer and build this um, home for ourselves. Thank you very much, Mr. Arrow. Let me ask now, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Uh, if there's anyone here that would like to be heard on this item, please put your name in the chat or uh, please raise your virtual hand. All right, I don't see anyone else. Um, I'm gonna now uh, therefore declare this public hearing closed and we will now hear any comments uh, by the council or if there are any other questions for staff. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to let folks know I've had a couple conversations with uh, with Celeste and Jason about the affordable housing that they hope to build on their property. Um, and they have some really exciting ideas that I'm really looking forward to um, hearing more from them when they come back to us with that project. Um, I think it's really exciting to have, you know, individual homeowners who are buying property in areas like this that need more affordable housing, proactively thinking about how to contribute to the community. And we don't see that very often. So I just wanted to um, recognize that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Any other comments, colleagues, or uh, questions? And if not, we'll move ahead with a motion. Uh, the first motion would be to adopt an ordinance annexing 924 Old Oxford, Highway, Old Oxford Road into the city of Durham and to enter into a utility extension agreement. So moved. Seconded. Second. Moved by Councilmember Reese, seconded by Councilmember Freeland. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it and the motion passes unanimously. The second motion will be to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilmember Reese, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes unanimously. And now we'll move to the third motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. Moved by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, seconded by Councilmember Reese. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, 
And I, I really appreciate the applicants being here. Good luck to you and good luck to you in your affordable housing plans. All right, we'll now move to item 21, Consolidated Annexation 551 Olive Branch Road. And we'll first hear our report from staff. Good evening, thank you again, Mr. Mayor. And Alexander Cale here with the Planning Department. Uh, here to present on 551 Olive Branch Road. So for this case, we did re receive a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, future land use map amendment and a zoning map change from Kurt Berger of FFAC Olive Branch East. This is for an area totaling around 20 acres. The proposal is for up to 108 residential townhouse units. This is east of the intersection of Doc Nichols Road and Olive Branch Road. Uh, the annexation petition does propose a contiguous expansion of the existing city limits. As shown on the existing condition sheet of the development plan, the 20 acre parcel does include a mix of hardwoods, pines, steep slopes, stream floodplain wetlands and a small portion that is within the middle Lick Creek bottomlands natural heritage area. Uh, the natural heritage program did perform an ecological assessment of the site, which you can see in attachment 14. The area of development that was identified in the development plan does not include the portions of the site identified in this middle Lick Creek bottomlands natural heritage area. Wetlands, floodplains, and steep slopes are found within proximity to the site, but not on the site itself. The proposed collector street, uh, per the Wake Durham Collector Street Plan, does extend through some of those environmental areas. In terms of the city and county operational departments, they did review this um, and did not find any significant negative service delivery costs or impacts to their departments. Um, and there were no severe operational impacts expected. Um, it's also a uh, budget and management and did a analysis and a fiscal impact analysis and found this to be a revenue positive project. There are um, four motions that are required for this application. The first is to adopt uh, the, annex, the ordinance annexing the property into the city of Durham and enter into a utility extension agreement. The second is to amend the future land use map. The third is to adopt a consistency statement. And the fourth is to adopt the zoning ordinance itself. Um, uh, again, if you have questions, I'm available and the applicant is also available to answer them this, here tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Cahill. Colleagues, you have heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And I first want to ask if there are any questions uh, for staff by members of the council. All right, then uh, we'll move on to hearing from the uh, folks who have signed up to speak. Uh, I have one, two, three, four, five people who've signed up to speak on this item. All of them have signed up as proponents. Um, I'm not sure um, if all of them want to speak or perhaps accompanying the applicant. So I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Neil Ghosh. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, are you with us? Can you be heard? I am with you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Mr. Ghosh. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, there are yourself, uh, Jesse Hardesty, Ryan Akers, Nick Williamson and Kurt Berger have all signed up to speak on this item as proponents. Are all of these folks members of your team? That is correct. And um, do you have any, um, are, are they all planning to speak? How, do, how are you planning to organize your presentation? Oh, probably I will speak and they'll be available to answer questions. All right. I see um, Mr. Harry Rassinen, and I hope I've got that name right, uh, also wants to speak. Uh, in opposition. And I'm now going to ask, is there anyone else here present who would like to speak on this item, either as a proponent or opponent? And uh, if so, could you please raise your virtual hand or put your name in the chat so I can apportion time? Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this item besides Mr. Rassinen and, and Mr. Ghosh and members of Mr. Ghosh's, uh, the applicant's team? Um, if so, please make yourself known now. Okay. All righty then. We'll begin with the proponents. Um, Mr. Ghosh, how long would you say that you need for your presentation? I won't need more than 10 minutes, probably, I don't know, closer to five. All righty. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Ghosh. And then uh, after that, um, Mr. Rassen, uh, we'll call on you for your comments as well. We appreciate you being here. All right, Mr. Ghosh. Uh, Welcome, and uh, please go ahead. And good evening, Mayor Sewell, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, and members of the City Council. 
As mentioned, my name is Neil Ghosh. I am an attorney at the Morningstar Law Group located at 112 West Main Street in Durham. I'm representing the applicant for the project tonight and Kurt Berger is on the line, as well as a couple members from McAdams, Ryan Akers, Nick Williamson, and Jeff Kaharski. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Cahill, for your presentation of the case. As he mentioned, the site is just under 20 acres and we are proposing to rezone it to a PDR 5.556 to allow for the development of 108 townhomes. Now, this project is one of two separate but complementary projects which include the acreage across all of Branch Road. Unlike that section though, this section is proposed as a PDR rather than a conservation subdivision, so it needs to be rezoned. The conservation subdivision across the street will come to you sometime in the future. Tonight, we are talking about this PDR project, but we actually started speaking with council folk prior to even submitting the rezoning application for this PDR. Probably in August of last year, um, the direction we got from council members we spoke with was very clear, as many townhomes as possible. So that is what we went with. This phase will consist of 108 townhomes. The community will offer one and two car garage townhomes in the low to mid 200. This will be far more affordable than the large lot single family we would be able to build by right and certainly allows us to provide more homes than we could by right under the current zone. The project also is consistent with the vision you all have expressed about residential development in the Searles area in light of the development limitations within that basin as outlined by staff in its presentation to you months ago. One of the limitations staff highlighted in its Searles presentation was the existence of special environmentally sensitive areas sometimes outlined in the natu Natural Heritage Program. This property contains land within the Natural Heritage Program, but the initial development of the site will preserve 20% of the existing tree coverage, including the entire Lick Creek Natural Heritage Area on the property. Uh, since receiving a vote from the Planning Commission, we have taken the time to address the concerns raised. The site will have two points of access on all of Branch Road. The northern access point is proposed across property, which is not part of the rezoning, but is part of the annexation. Because no homes are being proposed there, those properties did not need to be rezoned. We have worked out with staff the potential for the new road there to create a non-conforming lot. You should be aware that we are not able to get a site or subdivision plan approved, which would create a non-conformity. So there is no risk of that actually happening. To address that concern though, what will end up happening is that the remnant lot will be recombined with the HOA open space lot such that it will not become a non-conforming lot. And finally, there was, a, there was a concern about the east-west collector street shown on the D plan by a dashed line going through the property. That street is part of a larger regional collector road for this area as outlined on the Wake Durham Collector Street plan. The portion going through the subject property is somewhat fixed because it begins at an existing right-of-way on the front of the property and must align with an existing right-of-way reservation on the adjacent property to the rear, which is being developed by Mungo Home. Now, Durham is smart, so the initial development of the community does not require the developer to build the full length of that road before it will be useful or necessary. Furthermore, if we built it out right now, it would connect to nothing. Therefore, the Corps will not issue permits for those environmental impacts, and the only portion of the road we can build for now is the portion outside those areas. So the initial development of the community will not impact the steep slope and riparian area, and the newly built road should stop short of the 10-foot no-build area. The remainder of that facility will be built out sometime in the future once that road actually becomes viable and connects to something. On its face, this project seems to be on board with the feedback council has given on previous projects proposed in Searle. And if I'm not mistaken, this project I believe is the densest project you all have seen proposed in Searle. So I think that is headed in the right direction. That having been said, I mentioned previously that this project is one of two separate but complementary projects. The other project is proposed as a single family community directly across all of Branch Road. That project will in the future come to you as a conservation subdivision. And as a single family community, the price points in that project will be attractive, 
but they will be higher than what we envision for this PDR. And this PDR, the townhomes will be priced in the low to mid 200s, but on the single family side across the street, we think it probably will be in the low 300. My client recognizes the importance of new affordable housing in Durham. We think that we hit the mark on this PDR, but because we will be unable to make proffer in relation to the future conservation subdivision across the street, we want to make a strong commitment tonight in light of that fact. Tonight, my client would like to make a commitment on this project to pay $40,000 into the city's affordable housing fund in recognition of the fact that we will be unable to make any proffer on the future conservation subdivision site. Together, we believe both projects will make an ideal new construction community, but even alone, this PDR stands on its own merit. We hope to have your support tonight for this project and on the future one as well. We have our team available to answer any questions and thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Ghosh. Um, we will now hear from Mr. Rassanen. Um, Madam Clerk, can you make Mr. Rassanen available to be heard? He's been unmuted, Mr. Mayor. All right. Um, Mr. Rassanen, are you with us? Yes, are you able to hear me? Yes, um, thank you for being here. I hope I've got your name right. We appreciate having you. Uh, and I'm gonna give you five minutes uh, and uh, look forward to hearing your comments. Yes, sir, you got the name correct. And I uh, wanted to wish everybody a good evening and season greetings. Um, these are my concerns about the proposed consolidated annexation of 551 Olive Branch Road. <clears throat> about a month ago, Mr. Berger showed up on my doorstep with no mask on, um, pushing papers into my face about a uh, described need to encumber the front of my road frontage with a site distance triangle easement of 2,040 square feet in order to qualify the main access road to the site. Now, I see no mention of this in any of the attachments and I wonder what else is missing from this presentation. Um, I, while I'm not thrilled with the proposed easement across the front of my properties and do not care to have any trees removed or fencing restrictions imposed, I would consider a trade-off if uh, they were to put in a tree protection zone to the back of my property where the uh, trees six inches or larger were preserved for 30 feet in from the property line. Um, as the Planning Commission unanimously decided uh, in Attachment 8E, the request to propose inconsistent density by rezoning is not appropriate for the location. Single family structures would be more desirable and applicable to this area of the county. I'm also concerned at the impact of the wildlife, uh, deer, owls, birds, and other animals that live in this forest area. Um, this level of overdevelopment will force them out for sure and destroy their natural environment. Um, Durham City proper is located 10 or more miles to the west of here. And any proposal to include Durham City jurisdiction is not justified and is an attempt to avoid Durham County rules and restrictions. I don't see how developers are able to request selective annexation into the city to skirt county ordinances in an attempt to enrich themselves by packing more customers into an area. Um, affordable housing or affordable single family houses can be built. They don't have to build mansions. Um, and I don't care who has jurisdiction. It's the density of the zoning that would be concerned. Um, those are my comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Rassen, and we appreciate your being with us. Thank you so much. Let me ask now, is there anyone else uh, who is with us that would like to be heard on this item? Are there any of the attendees here that would like to be heard? Uh, if so, could you raise your virtual hand? I don't see anyone. All right. Um, all right, uh, colleagues, you have heard the uh, the members of the public who, uh, who have spoken tonight. And now I'm gonna ask if there are any comments or questions by members of the council. Council member Reese. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a question for Mr. Rassen and which specifically, what county rules are they trying to circumvent? That, uh, help me out with that. Madam Clark, can you make Mr. Rassen available to be heard? He is, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, the, the rezoning would uh, increase the density uh, inconsistent with the uh, surrounding area. All right, thank you, Mr. Rassen. Council Member Reese, any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, colleagues, any questions or comments by, for uh, staff or the applicant? So uh, I have a couple um, for Mr. Ghosh. There, there, there. The why is the why is why wasn't the site access issue settled before coming to the planning commission? Can you talk about that? Uh, so yeah, sure. It it, it was. Um, it just wasn't uh, very evident. So as you know, annotations don't go to the planning commission. So on the uh, zoning map, so typically when you do a rezoning with an annotation, the annotation boundary follows the rezoning boundary uh, in this particular case, that didn't happen. And that is because the area over which the second access point is uh, proposed, we're not building any houses there, so we didn't rezone it. So it is included in the annexation. It was included in the annexation at the time the item went to the Planning Commission, but the, those items wouldn't have been known to the Planning Commission. So, and you've explained this, uh, and so I think I'll ask Mr. Cahill this question. Mr. Cahill, can you explain to me the situation with the, um, as you understand it, and this was addressed somewhat in the staff report as well, with the second um, access point and what the, what the complication is there? Yes, I can uh, add as much context as possible. Um, so if they build more than 90 units, they'll have to uh, add a second access point. Um, that was, you know, it's 108 units that are being proposed. So that would, anything over the 90 would trigger that second access point. They can't commit to elements that are off the development plan. Um, so it's, we can't assess whether that site access will serve the area if it's on another parcel. Uh, I think that was one of the things that came up with Planning Commission that was a little bit um, confusing um, in terms of the site access. Um, I don't know if uh, any of my colleagues want to add anything to it. But... Well, let, let me just ask again, Mr. Cahill. Um, so just to make sure I understand, the, the, the applicant owns the property <clears throat> which would be annexed but not rezoned where the second site access point would be if they were to build more than 90 townhomes is that correct that's correct i'm not sure of the ownership structure but that would be correct it's it's under contract mayor Shul. uh it's not presently owned by the applicant but yes i think your basic premise is correct and uh, thank you, Mr. Ghosh. And then, um, and Mr. Cahill, uh, the applicant uh, uh, has uh, said that in order to build above the 90 townhome uh, limit, they would need the second access point. And it would be my understanding, should they not be able to arrange for the second access point, that they would be still be able to develop but only 90, up to 90 townhomes. That is correct, Mayor Shul. Right. Okay, my second question is regarding uh, Mr. Rassinant's comments, uh, and I'd like to uh, address this to Mr. Ghosh or to Mr. Berger. Uh, you heard what Mr. Rassinant said about uh, being approached concerning his home and an easement 
Uh, could you discuss that? I'm, I'm not sure I understood that and I would like to hear, uh, you, you could see he was concerned both by the approach and by the way in which he was approached. Uh, and so could you comment on that, Mr. Ghosh or Mr. Ghosh? Sure, sure, and I can, this is, this oh, is go ahead. Yeah, can I, I would like to speak to this. Um, I had met Mr. Raskin, he's our neighbor. Um, I had met him um, maybe a year ago, uh, uh, quite a while ago. We had a, a uh, before we moved in, uh, some heavy equipment to do some clearing for uh, some uh, drilling and, and soils investigation, things like that. So I knocked on his door and told him what we were gonna do. I thought we had a decent relationship. Um, the existing unnamed road right away is uh, the 60 foot right away, basically at the intersection. Uh, DOT is asking us if we can uh, secure from that resident in that property, a, um, a site easement. So I had some sample documents drafted up and I went to his house and knocked on his door and wanted to discuss it with him. I, I apologize, I made a mistake and didn't wear my mask from my truck to the front door of the car. I was standing in his front yard on his stoop. I, I clearly made the mistake. I am not a, an aggressive person and I didn't shove anything in, in his face. I did leave him with some documents so he would have an example he um, he declined at that time to uh, to you know uh, un he he declined to give us the easement and I understand and I asked him with my car would you can I leave these documents with you and that's how it went down I'm not an aggressive person I have no need this is the second time we've met each other and so I thought we had, at least had had a you know a, an introduction previously and uh, um, I, I sincerely apologize for any um, offense or uh, certainly wearing my mask. I'm, I am just, I made a mistake and I, I apologize for it. I wear a mask and uh, all, all the time and I just hopped out of the truck and it didn't get it right. There wasn't an aggressive, I didn't shove anything anywhere. And, you know, I was reviewing, again, it was an example, a sample of a previous project of an example that I got from McAdams of another project. So he could see exactly what I was asking for. And Thank Mayor you, Mr. Shul, mm, yes, uh, Mr. Gosh. Yeah, and uh, just for the record, that was uh, Mr. Kurt Berger. He is the applicant or representative of the applicant. Um, and I did want to say, I think part of your question was the nature of that easement. It was it's a site distance triangle easement, which NCDOT asked us to uh, pursue. Um, I think the maybe the obvious question after that is, do we need that easement? It would be nice to have it, but it, but the project can proceed without it. So uh, Mr. Rassanen's uh, property then is near the intersection of Doc Nichols and Olive Branch Road, is that correct? He is at the, if you will, the T-bone of that intersection. So if okay. you drove straight, you would drive into his front yard when you came Why up do you need that? Why is that? Why did you want that easement? Uh, DOT was asking if we could get it. So when people pulled up to turn right out of this community, out of that entrance, they could be uh, able to see cars. It's very close, there's some trees. I, I don't believe that you, I believe you can see it, but they don't, I mean, in fact, you can see, but they want to have um, an easement just to protect, uh, protect the drivers in the future, I guess. And, and, um... Yeah, so you don't really know if you can see there or not yet because you don't have that road there, right? We had it surveyed, sir. Okay. We had it. We had it surveyed, and we—it's the eyeball test. You stand there in line in the survey, and you can see the farthest face. So it generally um, indicates that there isn't a major obstruction in the way. DOT yeah. likes to have their their site their triangle distance easements. Yeah, Mr. Uh, is Mr. Judge on with us? I see he is. Mr. Judge, can I ask you to comment, um, when DOT asked for an easement like this, uh, a site triangle, I believe it was referred to, um, can you discuss that a little bit? And do you agree with the applicants? Yes, so uh, Bill Judge. A, a, a assertion that, that it's not necessary. Yeah, Bill Judge, transportation. Um, well, I would, I don't know whether or not an easement on uh, 
the resident's property is necessary or not. I will say that having adequate sight distance is absolutely necessary for the new street connection. So um, that is a common thing that, um, that either our department or in this case NCDOT uh, looks at before they would approve sort of a street connection, uh, almost the fourth leg of the intersection to Olive Branch, Doc Nichols. It's offset slightly, um, primarily because of that's where the right of way is. It doesn't line up perfect, but as the applicant said, that that would be for vehicles exiting the site as they come up to Olive Branch, so that they can look to the left for vehicles that are headed north towards NC ninety eight. Um, whether they need to make a left turn or a right turn, you need to be able to see an adequate distance to the left to see oncoming traffic. Um, so typically, what can happen is that um, if the property owners unwilling to grant an easement. Um, yeah, they, they can go out in the field and, and verify whether or not um, there's adequate sight distance within the existing right of way. Um, so um, probably it was primarily probably based on mapping or drawings that the applicant had provided. I don't know um, exactly what they provided to NCDOT that, that they were concerned about that. So. Mr. Judge, would NCDOT have to pass on this site lines at some point, or is it just uh, the applicant gets to decide that? Well, I mean, in order for NCDOT to approve the street connection, new um, new connection, the applicant will have to show that there's adequate site distance, okay. either inside the right of way or that they have an agreement from from the property owner to, to keep that area clear so that they don't install a fence or some other measure that, that would restrict site distance in the future. Okay, thank you. And, and while you're here, Mr. Judge, you heard the characterization by Mr. Ghosh of the situation with the, the uh, road, the collector road that is planned to go across this property. Um, how would you describe that situation? Um, and what thoughts do you have to offer us about that? Yeah, so I mean, it is on our adopted collector street plan, so they are um, accommodating that in, in with the development plan. Um, I think it is a bit challenging, some of the environmental features in this area and the likelihood of whether or not um, the property, in this case, immediately to the east, whether or not um, they will be able to, to get the easements and the, the permits from uh, in order to extend across that culvert. Um, short of it being some sort of city initiated. I mean, in an ideal non-environmental situation, uh, we definitely would want the collector street, but we have to sort of balance the, the environmental features and as well as the connectivity. Is that our judgment or is that the judgment of the, will that be the judgment of the property owner? It's prime, it's a combination of our judgment as well as the environmental regulatory agencies into showing that um, the need for that, that connection with the development. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Judge. Colleagues, forgive my uh, lengthy questioning there and I'm, I'm gonna uh, ask if there are any other uh, questions now. Uh, Mr. Cahill, do you have some comments to add as well on that? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, clarify uh, on the proffer because uh, staff uh, was not aware of that until uh, city council, um, the $40,000 affordable housing fund contribution. I, we just want to clarify that's what the applicant is intending to proffer. And if so, they will need to complete a consent form to authorize that. Yes, and that is the intent to proffer that. And I believe I have the form in my inbox. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cahill. All right, colleagues, other questions or comments at this time? All right, uh, I don't see any. And so I'm now gonna declare this public hearing closed and the matter is before the council. And uh, are there any comments uh, that uh, colleagues would like to make? Councilmember Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate your line of question and the clarity that the applicant and the neighbor have provided. I unfortunately cannot be supportive at this time of moving forward. Um, I think there's a number of concerns, including uh, 
I guess the proper and the and the and the lack of a commitment on the easement that that specifically are what raises immediately, but there are a number of concerns, especially around the environmental features. So I will not be moving forward with this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Freelon. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just kind of wanted to ask my colleagues, you know, what they think. You know, when I read the Planning Commission notes, um, there was a lot of confusion about the access points, which I, I appreciated your rigorous line of questioning there, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had some of the same questions. But some of the other concern was about the awkward juxtaposition of, you know, this very dense um, thing in this area where that's kind of not, that that's not the standard in this area. And um, I know that density is important for uh, the housing crisis and just having good housing stock. And I, I can't remember what the price point was. I think it was low to mid 200s. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I know that's important, um, uh, you know, but uh, I, I was I was hoping to hear from some colleagues uh, about the thoughts about the, you know, that that juxtaposition of this very dense thing in the in the Surrey Basin, um, you know, relative to what else is around it. Thank you very much, Council Member. That's an important question. Uh, any colleagues would like to comment on that? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, happy to share some general thoughts. So what, you know, what I understand is happening in the Stroves Basin based on our last um, presentation from staff is a, a, is a, a lot of development that is going to largely be residential because of environmental constraints. Um, and is largely going to be low density. This project is, I think, low medium density according to our scale. So I think a lot, like a lot of times when we talk about density, we tend to there's a tendency to exaggerate how dense something really is. Townhouse townhouse developments aren't really that dense. Um, they can't be. I think that they're probably these sorts of developments in the Searles Basin are as dense as I feel it's responsible to be based on the environmental constraints that were communicated to us by staff. Um, and that the, my, my main concern with Searles going in was that we didn't really have a plan for, you know, where to, to make the neighborhood more cohesive, where are the commercial areas gonna be? Where could people maybe build an office so that someone who lives out here doesn't have to drive into downtown or drive into RTP to get to a job or to get to a grocery store. Um, and I still have those concerns. So I think they were they were significantly mitigated by the, um, by the staff presentation that made it pretty clear that this area, because of the environmental issues is going to end up being mostly residential and that they're, really the only options are develop it at low to low medium density residential or don't develop it at all. Given that we are in pretty significant need of additional housing, I think it makes sense to to develop it. Um, and I feel like we're all there, there's always this tension between, you know, the the question of density being more, that more density is more affordable and more sustainable, but that also we're dealing with suburban areas that don't have transit and we're cutting down trees to build the houses. And also we have a housing crisis. <laughs> and also we don't have a lot of available land in the community anymore. I mean, I, I feel like these, these you know, decisions get, get pretty complicated where, where I tend to land most of the time is on, is on the affordability question um, because I feel like that's the most urgent crisis that we face. Um, and that a lot of the other issues can be mitigated. Like we can put transit to this area when we get to transit supportive um, density of population, which is which is another reason to go ahead and build more dense housing in these kinds of areas than to build single family. Um, I think that townhomes are not the you know they're they're not the greatest, but they're they're better than these very low density single family developments. 
And I don't think we're going to get any better density in Searles. And I don't know that it would be environmentally responsible to put more density in Searles. Um, so that's kind of how I'm approaching the area right now. And I, I'm you know, looking forward to having the small area plan so that we can figure out where there could be small commercial nodes so that people could walk to a corner store to you know, get a gallon of milk and not have to drive as much or where, you know, where there could be trails for people to be able to walk and bike. Um, but it's hard to, it's hard to plan all of that in advance of knowing that there's going to be any development out there. So we're kind of in this catch 22 all the time. I feel like that was really long, but there's a, it's, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of complications. Um, overall, you know, I, I, I wish we could do different things, but there's just, there's so many economic constraints and the fact that we're dealing with private profit motivated um, entities who are, who are building most of these products. Like we're, I, I feel like we're, you know, we're, we're just having to make the best choices out of a lot of not great options. Thank you. Thanks. I'll just say, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, you're the shortest winded of this pretty long winded group. And so you get to talk as long as you want. Okay. Happy to, happy to oblige every once in a while. <laughs> All right. Colleagues, uh, thank you for that. Um, other, other comments or questions at this time? I do have one more question for Mr. Cahill. Mr. Cahill, um, this property has the access point or potentially two access points out onto um, Olive Branch Road. But between Olive Branch Road and most of the property, is a, a uh, series of, is a, is a row of single family homes, correct? Uh, that is correct. Yeah. All right. Um, any other questions or comments, colleagues? I'll just make one comment, which is that uh, I think that I, I really um, appreciate uh, Mayor Pro Tem's really i thought a masterful kind of explanation of the of the the issues and uh, in this case i think that they're the the I, I find myself sometimes at odds with the planning commission on this issue of whether or not density next to a bunch of single family residents they usually think that's bad i usually think that's good if it's an area like this where it's just we have so many single family residents, it's I think it's really good to have some variety in housing in an area like this where you can have some differences in price points. You know, you can have some less expensive housing. Um, and so I just think that that's a tension that we have. Um, what worried me about this, and I feel a lot more comfortable now, and I know worried the Planning Commission as well, as you said, Councilmember Freelon is that is, is the kind of situation with these entrance points. Um, I am satisfied by staff's explanation that the second entrance point is not able to be satisfactorily developed as Mr. Ghosh has indicated that he thought it would be, uh, that, that this would limit the number of townhouses to 90 uh, and you know within our, within, our, uh, within our ordinance. So I was satisfied by that. Okay, any other thoughts, comments, questions? Okay. Um, then I'm going to uh, ask uh, for a motion um, on this. The first motion that we would need is to adopt an ordinance annex and fifth five to find out the branch road and entering into utility extension agreement. Move to adopt. Second. Moved by Councilmember Middleton, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Nay. Nah. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. No. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. And uh, the motion passes five to two. Um, the second motion will be to adopt a resolution amending the future land use from low density residential 
uh, to low medium density residential and open space and recreation. Moved as stated. Second. Second. Moved by Councilmember Middleton, seconded by Councilmember Freeline. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Nay. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. No. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And the motion passes five to two. And the third motion will be to adopt a consistency statement. Is there a motion to adopt a consistency statement? Move to adopt consistency. Second. Moved by Councilmember Middleton, seconded by Councilmember Caballero. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Nay. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. No. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And the motion passes five to two. And the final motion will be to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Move to the red. Second. Seconded. Moved by Councilmember Middleton, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Nay. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. No. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes five to two. Sure. I want to thank the applicant. And it looks like we have Gwen there. Um, and uh, good to see Gwen. Um, I want to thank the applicant for being here. I want to thank Mr. Rassanen for being here. We appreciate you. Uh, these are always difficult questions and good, good, uh, good arguments on both sides. So thank you very much. All right, I will now move to the final uh, uh, public hearing item tonight, which is consolidated an annexation item uh, 4115 Andrew Avenue and first to will hear the report from staff. Good evening, Mayor Shul and Honorable Council Members and Mayor Pro Tem. I'm Grace Smith. I'm with the Planning Department. I'll be presenting this case, 4115 Andrew Avenue Consolidated Item. A request for a utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, future land use map amendment, and zoning map change was received from Nate Hewler with Cambridge Properties. The site includes three parcels totaling 20.35 acres. The applicant proposes to change the zoning from commercial general and residential, I mean, excuse me, commercial general and residential RS20 to residential suburban multifamily with a development plan. This site is located in the suburban development tier. The portion of the site adjacent to US 70 is currently zoned commercial general. The remainder is zoned RS20. The proposed zoning is not consistent with the future land use map designation of commercial, but the applicant is seeking a FLUM amendment to low medium density residential, which would be consistent with the zoning re rezoning request. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Key committed elements include a maximum of 115 townhome units, townhouse units, monetary proffers to dedicated housing fund and Durham Public Schools, right of way dedications, reservations, and a center turn lane. City and county operational departments, such as police, fire, and EMS, have reviewed this request and have not identified any significant negative service delivery costs or impacts. There are no severe operational impacts expected on city departments. This case was originally heard at the June 2nd Planning Commission meeting. At that meeting, the motion to recommend approval failed 1 to 12. The applicant made additional commitments and, has asked, and was asked to be reheard by Planning Commission. The Planning Commission reheard the request and voted to recommend approval by a vote of 7 to 5 on September 22nd, 2020. Four motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second is to amend the future land use map. The third is to adopt a consistency statement and the fourth is to adopt the zoning ordinance. The applicant is on the line and has a presentation and I'm happy to share that um, when necessary. Thank you and staff and the applicant are here and available for questions. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Colleagues, you have heard the report from staff. Uh, before I declare this public hearing open, however, you all will remember that um, at our last meeting, I committed that uh, every two hours, we would give our, give our closed captioners a break. And I'm going to keep that commitment. Uh, we appreciate so much the work that they do. It's very hard to do it. Um, and they need a break. So uh, I'm going to uh, just uh, put us on pause for just uh, three or four minutes and give our closed captioners a break. And then we'll be back with the public hearing. So uh, it's a great time to go get yourself a hard boiled egg. <laughs> I'd have to hard boil it though. It's gonna <laughs> take more than five minutes. That was truly random. <laughs> Sounds like someone's actually boiling that egg. Hey, Carmisha. All right, we will get started and just uh, I'll give it one more minute and then we'll uh, get going again. All right, colleagues, uh, thank you all for uh, supporting our closed captioners, uh, and we, we thank them for their work. Ms. Smith, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, this public hearing is now open. You've heard the report from staff, and I want to first ask if there are any questions for Ms. Smith by members of the council. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Smith, good evening. Good to see you. Um, you, you made a, I think you made a representation that the applicant is, is making proffers and the affordable housing fund and to the school system. Did you have those amounts? I, I didn't, I didn't recall reading them in the, uh, packet. Have they specified amounts? Sure. Let me, um, look on with the development plan quick. Okay. And if I missed it, forgive me. I, I, my numbers are running together. And if you need to pull it up, I, I, don't, I don't need to, to hold up the hearing just for that. You can just give it to me later or bring it back. And Mr. Mayor, if you want to proceed. And I'll be glad to do that. And it might even be covered in the applicant's presentation. I'm sorry. I wrote down okay. some other proffers and didn't write that down. <laughs> That's okay. Of Thank course. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh-huh. That will, we will get that tonight though. Thank you, council member. All right. Um, other questions uh, for Ms. Smith? 
Okay, then we will now um, hear from members of the public who are here to comment on this item. I have here four people, uh, Nate Bueller, Bob Mishler, Patrick Biker, and Jamal Levon. And um, all of them are listed as proponents. Uh, I wanna know, um, let's see, I see Mr. Harry Rassanen and Mr. Ken Irvin are both here. Mr. Rassanen, um, could you raise your hand or put in the chat whether or not you would also like to speak on item 22? And also Mr. Irvin, uh, could, if you all would like to speak on, okay, Mr. Rassanen says no, thank you, Mr. Rassanen. And Mr. Irvin, uh, would you like to speak on item 22? If so, could you put that in the chat? Thank you, Mr. Irvin. I liked it in the old days where we would be in a council chambers together and I could find that out in something. <laughs> but we are where we are. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, Mr. Biker, uh, are the members who are otherwise signed up to speak members of the team of the applicant? Yes, Mayor Shule, this is Patrick Biker. Uh, Mayor Shule, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of council. I'm here tonight representing Cambridge Properties. Uh, the other uh, gentlemen that you've referenced are uh, members of the ownership and our neighborhood outreach team. We've been working together on this project for uh, quite a few months now. Um, uh, I, I, am I correct in understanding that there's no one from the public who's in opposition to this item, Mayor Shule? That's my understanding. Uh, I don't see anyone here else who is planning to speak, Mr. Biker. Yes, that's right. Are you planning to be the, um, are you planning to do the speaking for the applicant? Yes, Mayor Shule. All righty. Um, how much time do you think you'll need, Mr. Biker? Uh, well, we had a fairly lengthy PowerPoint ready to go, but in, in light of the fact that y'all have a work session tomorrow and uh, it's just feels, it always feels later than it really is this time of year. So um, in light of a 10 minute PowerPoint, um, would like to uh, just call to the attention of the council, the uh, comments by Planning Commissioner Tom Miller, uh, noting that we had a seven to five recommendation for approval. I would like to briefly address uh, council member Middleton uh, he asked a question that I need to get my reading glasses on to answer, but uh, the answer is a uh, $20,000 contribution to the Affordable Housing Fund and $2,500 for uh, Durham Public Schools, uh, even though this, uh, if I understood the staff report correctly, this uh, project actually doesn't, does not add any uh, school children, but because this site is so close to Bethesda Elementary, we did want to make a contribution. So uh, in light of what was uh, presented by um, uh, Assistant Director Smith uh, uh, in the planning staff report and uh, the comments of Commissioner Miller, uh, we rather than take up your time this evening, we'd just like to answer any questions that you may have and respectfully ask for your support. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Colleagues, uh, are there any questions uh, or comments for the applicant at this time? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, what is, uh, Patrick, good evening. Good, uh, good to see you, hear you. Yes, sir. Uh, what are the anticipated price points of the townhomes? Uh, mid twos, probably two, starting around the 240s and up. Okay. So we've, we've, what we did is uh, there's a committed element that uh, states the size of the townhomes will range from uh, 1600 to uh, I believe 2400 and that provides for um, our range of price points probably starting in the 240s. Thanks, uh, Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions uh, or comments for Mr. Biker uh, or the team at this time, his team? All right, um, Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mr. May. I just wanna make sure that I note that again, I know that we are, um, cognizant, but the public may not be, that there is no way that we can predict what a price point will be. We can give a guesstimation. I mean, it is based on the market. And so just noting that when we talk about affordable housing, I think it's important to make sure that we do um, clarify that these are guesstimations. They're not actual. 
Thank you, council member. Any other comments or questions for the applicant at this time? All righty, seeing none then I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed uh, and the matter is back before the council. If anyone has any comments, I'm happy to have them or would also accept a motion. Uh, the first motion would be to adopt an ordinance annexing 4115 Andrew Avenue into the city and to authorize the city manager into entering into an utility extension agreement. Move to adopt the ordinance. All right, I, I see some hands uh, that want to make comments, I think, oh. uh, but uh, no, that's okay. That's um, let's let's do that first, Council Member, then we'll come back to you. Sure. Council Member Middleton. Yeah, my bad. No worries. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, wanted to appreciate uh, the applicant for their work on this. I appreciate staff, um, the work they put in, in in bringing it to us like this. Um, I'm just, I was really impressed with the applicant's persistence in uh, at the Planning Commission in working to address the very significant concerns raised by commission members the first time the case came before them. I think it's clear when you look at the written comments of the commissioners the second time around the most recent set of comments, uh, you'll see that there was a that they really appreciated the commitment to grappling with the very real issues, some of the design elements, uh, some of the things that Commissioner Miller often raises. Uh, and so I really appreciated that. Uh, on the surface, this seems a, a little bit like the Olive Branch ma matter that we just passed, but I think there are some key differences. Uh, first and foremost, um, there were some environmental factors with, re with regard to the Olive Branch site that made me very uncomfortable. And I know that Council Member Freeman spoke to that, um, especially with the level of uh, development that, with, that has been approved for that site. But this particular site I don't, doesn't have that kind of concern for me. Um, there are, as the, there are some buffered streams on one side of the property, uh, but it doesn't look to me as though this will be impactful there. Um, and I just really appreciated uh, Commissioner Miller's uh, discussion of the way that the developer modified the proposal uh, in coming back to the Planning Commission. You know, so often we see developers uh, get a negative recommendation at the Planning Commission and they just decide, well, we're just going to go to the City Council and, and they'll, they'll get them to get them to approve it. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I think the process works better for us if, um, if the Planning Commission gets the developer's best effort, uh, because that's when we get a recommendation from the Planning Commission that is the most meaningful. Uh, if a project has changed so much from the time that the Planning Commission saw it and the time we saw it, it makes the work, all the work the Planning Commission put into reviewing that really not particularly helpful to us. Uh, and that's the reason they exist, is, is, to, is to inform the decision, the merits decision that we have to make on this. Uh, and I was convinced uh, by Commissioner Miller's remarks, despite the reservation that a number of planning commissioners continue to have about the project, I was convinced by Commissioner Miller's uh, comments here uh, that this project, while not perfect, uh, will fit in with the surrounding area and will be a benefit, and I'll, I'll be supporting the measure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Council Member. Um, and I believe Council Member Freeland also, uh, no, okay. Is there anyone else who would like to comment before the motion, Council Member Freeman? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate um, Council Member Reese's comments and just will note that it's important to distinguish the differences and I apologize, I wasn't, I was just gonna go ahead because of the lateness of the hour. But I, I also note that in this context of the, the comments from our commissioners, just noting that the concerns around um, traffic and, you know, making sure that folks are safe, they're going to continue to raise up and they're going to be the way that we're, that's on us and making sure that we move forward with our small area designing or small area planning. And so I just wanted to just make sure I make that very clear point that supporting this moving forward is not in spite of that, um, lack of having that planning in place. And so just noting that I will be supportive in, in noting all of the things that Council Member Reese noted as far as the sensitivity of this area, but, uh, or the, the lack of sensitivity in this area. But I, I do want to note that the environmental sensitivity in the previous case was different from this one. And, and that moving forward, we will have to make sure that we do address it because these cases are gonna to continue to come at each council meeting 
and I, I mean, I, I can, I, I mean, I'm sure it's fine for developers to move forward with a vote of five to two or, or six to one or what have you, but I do think that it's a disservice to our community to not have a plan in place and, and we're going to continue to move forward without that. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, council member. All right, colleagues, any other comments? All right, then uh, I will ask council member Middleton uh, go back to you, sir, for Re the motion. Yes, sir. Reinstating uh, the previous motion. Second. Th that would be the annexation uh, of 4115 Andrew Avenue to the city of Durham and the Yenner to the utility extension agreement. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by council member Reese. Madam clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council member Caballero. Aye. Council member Freelon. Aye. Council member Freeman. Aye. Council member Middleton. I vote aye. Council member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it and the motion passes unanimously. The second will be to adopt a resolution amending the future land use plan, uh, to low medium density residential. So moved. Move the state. Second. Moved by Council Member Reese, seconded by Council Member Middleton. Uh, Mayor. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shul. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Freelon. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. I vote aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, this third motion will be to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Moved by Second. Council Member Reese, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. I vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The motion passes unanimously. And finally, the motion will be needed to adopt an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance. So moved. Second. Moved by Council Member Reese, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Shule. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Aye. Council Member Caballero. Aye. Council Member Freelon. Aye. Council Member Freeman. Aye. Council Member Middleton. I vote aye. Council Member Reese. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. I want to thank the applicant uh, for being here today uh, and for, uh, I want to wish you all luck in developing this uh, project. We uh, trust you'll do a great job on it for the city. All right, uh, colleagues. Um, I did pull item one and I'll bring that item back to the council uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, and then um, the other thing I wanted to just remind everyone is of course we have a work session tomorrow uh, and uh, it'll be wonderful. And um, I also want to just uh, remind you all if, or let you know if you haven't seen it yet that there's an uh, email in your inbox uh, discussing the a couple of options for a special meeting of the council uh, on either just January 12th or 14th in the morning um, to discuss uh, the uh, to make a decision on going forward on our uh, choice for uh, a, 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 a contractor to help us search for our city manager. Um, and so please look at look for that email and let the city clerk know uh, which of those dates, whether one or both of those is uh, okay for you. I know we've already heard from a couple of council members. I know council member Reese, council member Freeman at least have responded. So uh, if you all could respond, that'd be great. So we can see if any of those dates works for all of us. And if not, we'll find the time that does. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, council members, thank you for everybody that hung with us tonight, our wonderful staff uh, who are still with us, and we appreciate you so much. Uh, yes, council member. 
Um, you pulled item number one. Uh, are, are, we're not gonna, are you gonna, are we gonna take some kind of action to defer consideration until a later time? Um, I don't know that we need to do that, but let me ask the, let me ask the, um, let me ask the attorney. Madam Attorney, I pull item one, which is an appointment to the RDU Airport Authority, which is an appointment that I make. Um, do I do we need to have a, some sort of action to defer it, or can I just simply bring it back to the council at the appropriate time? What's, what do we need to do? Mm, it, this is not a council appointment. It's just a mayoral appointment, correct? Mm -hmm. But yeah, but the council uh, concurs traditionally. It probably would do no, I don't know procedurally, Mr. Mayor, the exact answer to that um, without researching it, but it would probably do no harm for you just to bring it back to the council at a later date. I see, I see uh, Ashley Wyatt has commented to refer it back. So I'm gonna ask uh, that it be referred back, uh, I guess in this case to me, since it's my appointment. <laughs> um, and I have no, no problem having a vote on that if people would prefer. So why don't we have a, a, a vote on that if, if that would heighten everyone's comfort level. Um, Mayor, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, more than a legal issue, I think this is a parliamentary issue. And, and, and insofar as this falls totally within your purview, I'm comfortable by unanimous consent, just allowing you to, the matter to be referred back to you without any, any objection. I, unanimous consent for you to just do that. I don't think we need a vote. I, I see some thumbs. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, council member. Thank you, Madam Attorney. All right, colleagues, thank you so much. Um, I would say happy holidays to everyone, but we're gonna see you tomorrow, so we'll get another <laughs> chance to do it. Uh, but uh, it's always good to it be with you. It is winter solstice, happy winter solstice. Yes, happy winter happy solstice. Winter solstice. Shortest day of the year. All righty, um, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, let's go out and show an affirming point. Yes. See you all tomorrow. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.